Welcome to Science and Wisdom Live, where scientists and meditators meet. So Dr. Van Lomo, Keshe Namdak, it's a pleasure having you on the podcast. And I'm very excited to hear this conversation between both of you. And I'd like to just get right into it because there's such deep questions we're contemplating today. The first one's about consciousness, just to start easy. One of the great unsolved scientific questions is on the origin of consciousness, um, the fact that we have self-awareness. And there is a scientific materialist view that all consciousness originates in the brain and has a material cause. And that one day we'll actually be able to prove this. Right now, it's it's a belief. You know, I guess it's a scientific belief. So, Dr. Van Lommel, to start with you, to what extent do you agree with this kind of scientific materialist view that all conscious experiences originate in the brain? I was raised with the idea, with the never proven hypothesis, that consciousness is a part of brain function. So that was what we learned in school, what we learned in medical school as well. And this. Because I've met a lot of people with a near death experience. We share their near death experience that they had during cardiac arrest. And we have cardiac arrest. We know now, and we can discuss it later as well. There is no brain function there. So people lose consciousness, what we call clinical death. Because consciousness have no uh, body reflexes, there's a function of the cortex of the brain. They have no brain cell reflexes. Like the dead reflex, corneal reflex, wide and pupils. They have no breathing. The breathing center is close to the brain stem. When you measure the blood flow to the brain, it's zero within one second. And when you measure the electroactivity of the brain, the EEG, it's zero fat line within 10 to 20 seconds. And at that very moment, people have an enhanced consciousness with cognition, with emotion with memories from early childhood, from, with uh, future events as well, uh, meeting disease relatives. And this is totally Im impossible according to our current materialist approach in science. So that's why we started. It started for me with scientific curiosity that what I heard was not possible according to our current paradigm. <laughs> it might be interesting to have Geshe Namdak come in here right away and talk about the Buddhist understanding of consciousness and how we might remain conscious when the blood and the brain activity stop uh, in the way Dr. Van Lomo um, is talking about. I mean, the Buddhist interpretation of consciousness is, is slightly different from uh, what we have at the present in mainstream and neuroscience uh, because consciousness is not produced by the brain as such. It has a correlation. We say that consciousness is not matter, right? We have the, mat mat the world of matter, but we also have a world of consciousness. So consciousness is a different kind of um, aspect of, of a phenomena that is not considered as, as matter, although it has a correlation with, with brain and with brain function. And uh, yeah, some scientists of the past also have indicated, even Penrose, for example, also indicated that the brain actually facilitates consciousness rather than causes consciousness to come about. There's one aspect, and in Buddhism, I think, if you look at the correlation between brain and, and consciousness, it can be two-way traffic. The brain can produce states of consciousness, and consciousness can produce, uh, as we know in neuroplasticity, consciousness can produce uh, to change the brain. So if in, in the research of OCD, obsessive compulsive disorder, especially uh, that done by Jeffrey Swartz, for example, you come to similar conclusions that if you train your mind, you can train your brain, right? But if you don't train your mind, then there's a possibility that the brain actually tells you what to do. So in that way, there's a correlation between a physical brain and what we actually call consciousness within the Buddhist context. It's not physical, it's not matter, although it has a correlation with matter. So we can measure the correlation or the, you know, the interaction, so to say, but consciousness itself is still quite of a question mark in, 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 in modern science. I think we totally agree. There's no second. Oh, we totally agree. <laughs> so the, the, when we talk about the mind-brain relationship, I think the, the brain has a facilitating function or an interface function or even a filter function. So uh, 
consciousness itself, the higher aspects of consciousness, or enhanced consciousness, is beyond time and beyond space. There's no beginning, has no end. And uh, it's why I call it a non-local consciousness because it is beyond time and space. It's always at the same moment. People can experience everything. And, and for me also, consciousness is fundamental in the universe, like information and energy. And the brain is just a receiving and a transmitting instrument. So it transmits information from your senses and your body into your consciousness. And you receive information from your consciousness into your brain and body. It's not just your brain who receives information, it's just your total body, also your heart receives information from consciousness. And, and that you can, let's say, we can never prove the continuity of consciousness by science because uh, a current material science is only is real when you can measure it, when you can duplicate it, when you can objectify it, when you can falsify it. The consciousness, what we think and what we feel, we cannot measure, we cannot objectify, we cannot duplicate, we cannot falsify. This consciousness, what we feel and what we think, is beyond our current materialist science. So we have to change science as well, we have to expand science into the, what we call the post-materialist science to include subjective experiences. So we, can, we are able to study consciousness in all its aspects. Yes, yeah, so I like the term uh, non-locality in general, but also in relation with consciousness, because what we say in Buddhism, consciousness is not matter, it's not physical, so it doesn't have any location as such. Excellent. And then if you talk about an advanced forms of consciousness, as we can measure and, and see uh, developing in, in, in the new dead experience, for example, also in, in Buddhism, we talk about that more coarser forms of consciousness, and in particular, sensory perceptions of ordinary sensory perceptions, they are very much related with the physical brain and the physical body. But the more subtle consciousness becomes, the less dependence it seems to indicate in the Buddhist scriptures. And in a similar way, we see that in, in, in the findings in, in uh, uh, Dr. Bim von Lohmann uh, had written quite clearly about that in the near that experience that we see a subtler form of consciousness because according to the Buddhist interpretation and when you die the the, the course course forms of consciousness they they seem to kind of um, become dormant and and actually uh, the consciousness becomes more and more subtle same as you fall asleep and and have, have a dream consciousness for example so at the time of death we have a similar process and then the mind becomes even more subtle and that probably explains why people have and especially in in, in kind of out of the body experiences really have perception which is valid, right? As we can see in different types of research that between, what is it? Pim van Dommen might know better than I do, but it's between 83 and, and, and 93 or 94 percentage of what people experience actually is valid, is correct a form of knowledge they gained in this kind of period. So that's very interesting to see the more subtle the mind becomes, probably the less dependence on, on, on actually the physical brain. That's exactly what we found in the, the scientific research on the death experience, not only our own Dutch study, which involved 344 consecutive survivors of cardiac arrest in 10 Dutch hospitals. And we found that 18% of those patients had a classical near death experience with all the uh, universal elements like uh, being aware of being dead, uh, out of body experiences. Uh, Eternal experience, meeting diseased relatives, being a meeting a being of light, uh, experience unconditional love and universal wisdom, mm. coming to a border, and then consciousness coming back into into the body. And during that period, you can have a life review or a flash forward as well. So you have all aspects of consciousness. And you have, a, let's say, the cardiac arrest of two or five minutes, and you can talk for weeks about it because everything happens at the same moment. When you concentrate about some event in the past, you will be there. You will meet, be also involved with the consciousness of other people in the past as well. So you connect with everybody else in the past, and not only each de deed or each word, but also each thought you ever had is kept. And has influence on yourself, on yourself and others as well. That's very interesting because 
how you describe the different uh, things that people see or the consciousness, so to say, of those people in, in the states of, of NDEs actually experience is, is very similar than what we ex explain in various texts, that when the mind becomes more subtle, how the elements dissolve and actually what appears to consciousness and how you go from this life to what we call the intermediate state uh, uh, of, of life, so to say, and then after that, uh, take take rebirth, so to say. So it's it's a very similar kind of um, things explained in a near death experience as we have in certain scriptures uh, in, in the Buddhist kind of canon to explain actually what's happening to consciousness. Although we don't really talk much about the people coming back to life <laughs> as we have in, 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 in people in your cases, but the process of death is, 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 seems to be very, very similar in explained, yes. I think it's a universal element of, of, of human condition that you have this aspect of non-local consciousness. And um, I think meditation is also a way to be in contact with a higher aspect of consciousness as well. And we also, what you, you talked about neuroplasticity, Buddhist monks who are meditating for years have a different uh, activity in the brain as well, far more gamma waves, permanent changes in the brain as well, as well than during meditation, their brain changes as well, again. So uh, it's mind over matter. So you also know it for placebo effect when you treat patients with chronic depression or pain or Parkinson's disease, when you treat it as placebo, you see the same changes in the brain as well. You really treat them with medication. So you, and that's the same with the immune system as well. So you change your body, you change your brain by changing your consciousness. So we are depending on it, on consciousness. But consciousness is fundamental. It starts with consciousness. Mm. Yeah, so that's for us, uh, yeah, it's a quite important aspect because if you train your mind well, then we can change the brain, right? That has already been proven. So it seems to be quite essential to know more about consciousness and its emotions and actually how to deal with emotions and how to train the mind. So those kind of aspects, I think, uh, if you combine modern findings in, in the scientific world with not only Buddhism, but many other forms of world religions or forms of faith, I think then we get a very rich understanding of consciousness and not only mere having the knowledge, but we can use that knowledge to, to, to start with, with pilot programs to let people deal with problems in life they, they have to deal with. Like, we know a lot of things, especially during pandemic, uh, yeah, depression and, and, and many mental issues came up. So I think that not only Buddhism, but many forms of, of faith and religion have a lot to offer. And if we combine it with a scientific kind of evidence supporting, uh, you know, uh, change your mind, change your brain, then I think uh, there's very, very interesting fields uh, for, for, for progress and, and, and enhancing and, and maybe building a kind of better society, so to say, in the future. Yeah, so there's a potential there. I again, totally agree with you. Yeah. It, 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 because an important fact is that it's not only critical medical situations like cardiac arrest or coma or near drowning or loss of blood during a complicated childbirth, but also a severe depression or existential crisis or just walk in nature or meditation. You can have access to this enhanced aspect of consciousness as well. So you don't have to die or to nearly die to have this kind of experiences. Yeah. It's important that for the scientific discussion about the mind brain relationship then it's important to do have to study the scientific research on survivors of cardiac arrest because in those circumstances we know that the brain does not function at all and at that very moment people have the hand there's also the possibility of perception as you told before uh, there have been many cases with uh, corroboration of vertical perception in periods of out of the body and what happened, what they have, what they perceive during cardiac arrest or during surgery or during coma. And you can objectify it, corroborate those experiences with the doctors, nurses, or family members. That more than 90% was totally correct mm. what happened during general anesthesia or cardiac arrest or, or coma. So that proves that indeed people are out of the body and have the possibility of perception, but the perception is different. It's not by your eyes. You have a field at 60 degrees, you can see details in an overview, and you don't hear people speak, but you have what you call telepathic contact. Mm -hmm. 
direct thought comes through. So you know what people think. So you also know what people tell you as well. So this kind of aspect makes it very intriguing that consciousness is not dependent on brain function in those circumstances as well. The more subtle the mind becomes, so to say, maybe less dependence. And there's many advanced levels of meditation who go in that direction. And then it shows that at a time of death for, and we only have a few cases, but uh, there is research being done of people uh, who are capable of using that subtle mind at the mind of death and then stay not for a few minutes, but stay for a few days or weeks at a time. And it's a very interesting phenomenon that, that is being researched. We have three, 13 cases documented and there's no uh, brain activity being measured at that time in these 13 cases, but the body doesn't decay after the clinical death. And then we talk about two or three weeks or sometimes four weeks in, in South India, where it's an average or 25, 30 degrees centigrade. So it's a very interesting phenomenon as well, that there is still something there that prevents the body from decaying in those kind of circumstances. So from a Buddhist perspective, you talk about a more subtle consciousness at the time of death in practitioners who are capable of using that subtle mind because it's an advanced form of consciousness, right? It, and it's, it's, it has much better perception. So it's a very interesting uh, correlation between what we see in the near-death experience or out-of-the-body experiences is, and these meditators will use actually that mind in, in a structured way of meditation. Yeah, it's very interesting. It was the previous Kamapa who had this, isn't it? Uh, there's many, quite a few. We have about 13 and cases documented. Kamapa at that stage, his body was well functioning, well not functioning, but not decaying for, for 10 or 40 days. Yeah, yeah, there's many. Uh, it's holding the Kamapa, the previous one, and then there's a, quite a few others yeah. uh, who showed similar kind of, yeah. Cap capabilities to to use that mind and then stay uh, for a particular period. Yeah, well, it's medical. It's medical impossible, but it happens. So we have to ask questions. Yes. For me, yeah. always, I say my definition of science is asking questions with an open mind. I forget what your world, forget your concepts. Don't have a tunnel vision, but, but look what is happening and try to find an explanation. That this is science for me. Yeah, and in Buddhism, we say this. I mean, the Buddha himself said, don't accept you venerable scholars. Don't accept what I say out of respect for me because I'm a very well-known person. But you should examine what I say. You know, check it out. Like you examine gold or precious substance to break it down and and and, and melt it or, or whatever possible way of, of, of an analytical approach you have. You should examine a question. Yeah. It's, I know the quote is very wise. <laughs> yeah. Is there any sense of an explanation, <clears throat> a scientific explanation for being able to form memories when the brain isn't working or to have sense experiences when the you know, sensory uh, mechanisms of the body aren't functioning? Is it too early to ask these questions? Are we, are we just at the point that we're observing that this is happening, but we don't know how? Or, or is there some explanation or theory? Well, also in the past, we call it in the past, of, according to materialist science, that we believe that, that memories are produced by the brain and localized in the brain. Now we know because of this scientific research on survival of chronic arrest, that when the brain does not function, people have memories from early childhood, many more memories they ever had during their waking consciousness. And they also feel connected with the consciousness of others in the past as well. So they're it's also why the near death experience is called the experience of oneness. You connect it with everybody and everyone. And also you connect it with the memories from early childhood. And also you have you flash forward with the memory from the future as well. So you have access to this kind of uh, memories because in this non-local realm, everything is available. Um, so memories are not produce nor localized in the brain, but you can, when you are back in your body, then it comes back a little bit. But let's say the, 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 uh, the wisdom you had, the knowledge you had about quantum physics, whatever, you said in the end, you said, oh, this is so simple to understand that you're back in your body, you don't remember anymore. So your, your, your brain is also the filter. You don't remember everything 
what you really experience during the end. I mean, the same in, in, I mean, when we talk about memory, as we say, in, in, even in, 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 in neuroscience, it's, it's very difficult to say where is memory stored, right? So, and, and, and what, what uh, you, you're saying is kind of it's non local, right? It's, it's very, very similar thing we talk about Buddhism. And Aaron Schrodinger, he came to a very interesting quote in his, in yeah. his book, What is Life, saying information is present and stored in, in, in wave functions in a non local space and therefore uh, non locally uh, accessible which is a very interesting uh, statement because when we talk about information uh, in the Buddhist context, we have advanced forms of consciousness that can know things, right? And that you previous could not know or, or you were limited in your, in your development whatsoever. So that means that previously that knowledge was, it's not that knowledge was not present, that knowledge was present, but we just didn't know or what you just now indicated that people in the NDE uh, they or an out of the body experience, they have a subtle consciousness, then have much more clear perception. Then they come back, and then the brain causes kind of a filter, or or it's it becomes kind of uh, more difficult to have a similar kind of perception. So that means that a trained mind, as we indicate in Buddhist uh, psychology, a trained mind can generate even with the physical brain and with the physical body we have, we can still generate subtle forms of consciousness and generate this kind of higher levels of perception. Yeah? So that doesn't mean that the information uh, we know is not there when you don't know it, right? So that means you can access it when the mind becomes more subtle and, 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 and there is a possibility of, of clairvoyance and all kinds of other things within mainstream science is still quite of a challenge. But there are a lot of research, a lot of research already quite interesting to see that uh, that there is a possibility, and even in, in remote viewing, for example, uh, there's a lot of research being done by Russell Tark and others funded by the CIA. So it's kind of high level of research that actually proves forms of consciousness that have access to uh, information that is not local with non-local consciousness. So that quotation of, of Aaron Schrodinger is, is very interesting, that the information is present, is stored in the kind of a wave function, and in a non-local space, which is not locally uh, accessible, which is very, very Buddhist in one way, because we talk about consciousness not being non-local, and also the information or knowledge doesn't always have to be matter, doesn't always have to be something physical, that can also be in, in other forms of categories of mind, or what we call non-associated composition of factors, kind of uh, as aspects of, of reality, or aspects of phenomena, that is not actually the physical matter as such but can be known by, 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 by developed levels of consciousness. So it's a very interesting uh, correlation uh, there to see between what you were saying and also Aaron Schroeger and the quantum physicist actually came to similar conclusions. It's very interesting, yeah. It all, everything comes together, isn't it? So it, it's also for, for everything is already there in the highest, higher aspects of consciousness. But we call when a scientist like Einstein had a flash of insight, about E is a secret or, or the, the C6 uh, molecule, etc. All comes as a flash of insight from the higher dimension of consciousness. And then you have to put it into words in this physical world, which is not easy at all. But everything is already there. What's also interesting is to know that when everything is information and consciousness is as a scalar wave, or wave function to get it into the physical world, you need consciousness to get it into this world. So, uh, and there are many uh, uh, physicists who believe in the role of consciousness, but are, the majority of physicists still don't believe in the role of consciousness, but it is changing as well. Uh, you can prove that light behaves as waves, you can prove that light behaves as particles, both is true, but that cannot be both true. It's depending on the consciousness of the experiment, which gave the result of the experiment. So consciousness is primary, consciousness is fundamental, and what we perceive here in this physical world is dependent of our state of consciousness. And when we change the state of consciousness, we change the world as well. And what you told about the, I call it the non-local information exchange. 
the old old fashioned terms is is telepathy or future events or prognostic dreams or remote viewing. They're called a non-local information activity. You receive information not by your senses and not by your body, and it is beyond time and beyond space. And all these kind of remote viewing, telepathy, uh, prognostic dreams, etc., is depending on this kind of information, which comes from the higher aspects of consciousness. What is interesting to know is that the, what William James uh, called the threshold of consciousness, so the capacity to receive information from the higher consciousness, has permanently changed in keeping with an NDE. So they don't receive just channel one their own consciousness, but channel two, three, four, five, five other consciousness as well. So they know that people are ill, they know that people will die in three weeks, they know that the mother has died and so So they get a lot of information because the reception ability has permanently changed of the body and of the brain. So maybe to add to that, maybe it's, it's good to know that in, in, in Buddhist psychology, we talk about six types of consciousness, right? We have the five sensory perception was yeah. quite limited, right? But the mental consciousness has been a, a, grouped as a different kind of classification. And when we talk about these kind of experiences and we talk about meditation, we use this mental consciousness yes. because sensory perception is very limited. A mental consciousness is something uh, beyond limits. And that's why, you know, in the research of, of Richard Davidson's, this kind of Olympic meditators, as they call it, yeah. we have this kind of huge amount of meditations behind their belt that produce gamma waves beyond the chart, never yeah. measured before in the human brain. So that's the development of this mental consciousness. And an NDE also is actually what the person experiences is this mental consciousness. It's not sensory perception of the ordinary senses, right? So yes. we talk about this mental consciousness in the Buddhist kind of terms that also goes from this life to the next life. And if you develop it, if it becomes more subtle, then there's more possibility of, of, of accessing this kind of non-local information with this kind of non-local consciousness because that's what it is, right? And yeah. uh, that seems to be a very a lot of yeah, common locus or a lot of kind of common ground between what you are talking about and what you're writing about and what we talk Buddha talked about 2,500 years ago until uh, yeah Buddhism to the present it's very interesting yeah it's quite interesting well, like also when you read the Vedas and the Upanishad you get the same information when you read Plato Plato wrote 2,500 years ago that the body is this temporary carrier of the soul which is eternal and he writes about a classical the death experience of the soul, the ur as well. It has been known in all times, in all religions, in all cultures, these kind of experiences, because enhanced consciousness has always been there, uh, has always been experienced. And then interesting to, to say that about Plato, because in the visions from air, there's a very interesting uh, statement there as well, yeah. that when uh, you leave the, the, the physical body, then there are seven days before you actually again go to the mortal life. That's what it says. And if we study things in the Abhidharma scriptures, we also talk about the same period of seven days. Mm. And in the in the Jewish kind of tradition, when you have the seven days of of, of, of mourning called called Shiva, it's very interesting that we come to similar kind of periods and, and we talk about similar types of, of consciousness at the time of death and beyond. Yeah, it's very interesting. And you also talk about Bardo, isn't it? We the have bardo. an intermediate, the bardo or intermediate uh, state. So yeah. that means that uh, what you what people experience in NDE is probably very similar. Yeah, people go to a border or go to a bridge or go to the end of the tunnel, and then there's a border often, right? And then at the time of the border, they being called back or they feel they have to go back. So there's a kind of cause and effect relationship between the body and the mind is still is still is still present. Yeah, it's not that the coin is completely left the, the, the physical body. So then what happens in when a need that experience sort of actually comes back to life, it doesn't go beyond the body, right? Mm -hmm. In most cases, it comes back to life. So yeah. that we can probably explain that from the consciousness leaving the body and then go into this bardo state or intermediate state. If that's been established, then there's there's no way back to the body anymore. Right. So that's general speaking, that's kind of one of the interpretations. So that's very similar to what we see in the, in the near experience. And then they come into this intermediate state or this bardo, 
and that's sometimes seven days, and that is the same as we just talked about, and that can repeat itself for seven more times. And then the actually continuity of consciousness takes kind of rebirth, so to say, or as in the visions of air in, 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 in with Plato, it talks about again a mortal body. Uh, people take rebirth in other other form. Yeah, so it's very similar. Is it always 49 year, uh, days or? Uh, no, it, it can be a second, it can be a, a few minutes, it can be one day, seven days, but they say more or less a maximum of 49 in the Abhidharma literature. But there are also other texts I saw in, in the Sakya tradition, a few of the tantras, where it actually talks about as a general statement, longer periods might be possible. And mm -hmm. also, if you take um, Ian Stevenson research mm -hmm. into account, yeah. then with, with the studies of, of reincarnation, then sometimes the period is slightly longer. Yeah, so uh, right. that makes sense that it's, it's maybe not that fixed, but that's just a general kind of interpretation of the period. Yeah. So in this case, it's the young children, aged from four to six, talk about the previous life. Usually it was an, uh, uh, a death with a lot of violence. Uh, murder, soldiers, etc. So it was a, 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 not a normal death, and then they have the spontaneous recollection of the previous life as well when they were young, and when they are older than six, they don't remember it anymore. And then so it is in, in this kind of death with a lot of violence. It is about four to six years that people remember it. It's quite yeah. intriguing, isn't it? Yeah. It is, it is. But but the, the thing probably is that because they die in an accident, they die instantaneously, right? So probably because of that, the memory might be stronger. Right? Yeah. So it's very... And then that's what I like about uh, his research, Ian Stevenson, that he says, I'm not proving reincarnation, but what he says, there is something that carries information from a previous personality to the present, right? So and that in Buddhism, we call that the continuity of consciousness, so to say, because that carries all this information with it in a non-local kind of form. Yeah. So it's very interesting among different types of, of, of research, we can see there's a lot of common ground in, in, in not only Buddhism, and also in other, in the Hindu philosophy, we talk about very, very similar aspects here as well. So it's very interesting to, 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 yeah, to see the common ground. Yeah. So my title of my lectures and my title of my latest article is The Continuity of Consciousness. So I never talk about life after life because life is a biological system. And when you die, there's no biological system left. So it's not life after life. It's just continuity of consciousness. So I totally agree again with you. <laughs> so the Dutch title of your book, Consciousness Beyond Life, is actually uh, similar, right? Uh, it's yeah. Eindlos, uh, Eindlos Bewusstsein, yeah. which is actually endless consciousness. Yeah. It was a huge discussion with HarperCollins because there's a... The section where they decide what the title would be and the infinite consciousness of endless consciousness was too much. Whoa, whoa. So they created with a lot of titles, and I had very problems. So at last, it was a kind of consciousness beyond life, which not really my title, but it, uh, it, it, it'll do. <laughs> the, Dr. Van Lommel, there's you also talk about and write about people who are transformed by near death experiences. <clears throat> that when people come back from these experiences, there's very often a, a greater sense of purpose, greater love, greater acceptance, and so on. Could you talk a little bit about that? So far, we've just talked about this as a kind of, you know, an interesting, fascinating phenomenon of the continuity of consciousness. But can you talk a little bit about how we're transformed by near-death experiences? Well, that's a very important aspect. I think when the transformation that proves objectively that there was a subjective experience. So that's what we did in a longitudinal study with interviews two and eight years after the cardiac arrest. We found that only patients with an ND had this classical transformation, which is no fear of death anymore. They're convinced of a continuity of consciousness. Uh, they, 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 they call an afterlife. And the second is a new insight of what is important in life. It's an insight experience as well. It's not just a uh, yeah, that experience, an insight experience. What is important about life? And that is, first of all, to have unconditional love and empathy and compassion toward yourself. Accept yourself, accept your negative aspects we all have. And then accept and have unconditional love towards others because you're connected with everybody else. 
and you're connected with nature, with animals, with plants, with the planet Earth as well. So they are connected, and they feel connected as well. That's what we why it is called the experience of oneness. And uh, external aspects of life, like say, a, a big car, beautiful house, uh, young body, clothes, is a less important. It's not about money anymore. It's about giving love to others. And what they experience in their life review as well, they see again or relive again how they gave love or didn't give love at all. So it's a confrontation of how you live. It's never a combination, but it's a kind of insight. And the third aspect of transformation is what I call the enhanced intuitive sensitivity. That's what you have the information, the local information that says that you feel things from others. You know future events as well. The problem is that the transformation is not well known and not well expected in the Western world. I always, as a joke, it's a way you have a near death experience in the Western world. Um, it's a, a, a spiritual trauma. You have years of depression, homesickness, and loneliness because you cannot talk about it, you cannot share it with others, nobody will believe you. When you live in India, you will really have congratulations in your experience. So the different aspects of the society is so important. So a near death experience has usually a positive aspect, but the after effects are negative, are a lot of work, it takes years to share it with others and to accept it and then take years again to integrate it, to change the way you live. Sometimes, we had one study done in 82 patients with a near-death experience with a time interval between seven months or 70 years. So the mean interval was 24 years. And after the mean interval of 24 years, still 50%, half of them were not able to talk about the NDE. So it's a trauma. They cannot share it with others. So it's, it's beautiful the content of the enemy, but to be back in your body in this Western society, materialist society, it's hard. In case you I'd love you for you to reflect on that a little bit because we, uh, in Tibetan Buddhism, we meditate on the death process, you know, sometimes every day, sometimes multiple times a day, um, maybe for some of these same reasons or same similar benefits. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, I mean, in Buddhism, uh, we meditate on suffering, we meditate on death and impermanence. And some people might think, oh, those Buddhists, they must be so depressed. <laughs> because this thing, normally, uh, the common man, so to say, doesn't think too much about it. But uh, if you like to put those things aside, then when that comes, it's a problem, you know, that, that we can see. And, and, and also Carlo Rovelli, actually, in one of his books, he says, fear of death is a fault in evolution. Why should you fear something that is a reality? It's a very interesting statement. So that means that uh, preparing for that, because it's coming anyway, right? The, the moment you're born, you know you're going to die. And to prepare for that, acceptance is extremely important. And acceptance only comes by the power of understanding. So that's why we, we spent quite some time uh, for that was one of the aspects uh, to, to contemplate that in impermanence. But another aspect, uh, which is more in the Buddhist kind of part or the Buddhist progress in the spiritual part, so we say, is it motivates us. And, and what Pimba Longman just indicated that some people become more spiritual, become more compassionate, they're not too much interest in, in, in fame or money in this life anymore. And that's exactly the purpose of meditation on death and impermanence in the Buddhist spiritual part, because it helps us to motivate us not to waste time, but to progress and see what's the real essence in life, what's the real meaning of life, and how do I develop myself? How can I help others? to develop as well. So uh, the contemplation of death and impermanence by itself is actually a tool to help us to motivate ourselves and to actually uh, accomplish a more and more a sustainable form of, of happy life, so to say, for self and others. So it's a kind of a motivator to, to contemplate death and impermanence. Yeah. So when the people lose the fear of death, they also lose the fear of life. So there's no fear of life anymore. That's why they have a much better life as well. But again, 70% of people that they get a divorce because the part is it's not the same man or wife who married or married before. They say it's changed in essence so much, but they don't feel life anymore as well. Yeah, so it's kind of yeah, an experience they have first-hand experience, and then that's for them a life-changing kind of uh, yeah. aspect, right? 
So, so in the Buddhist context, the more you contemplate these points, the more actually your life starts to change. And we see that in a, in a very positive way that people start to dedicate more time and effort in, in, in what life is actually really about, other than just making money and, 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 and having reputation. So it's very interesting uh, to see the common grounds between the need and experience that people, you know, try to get more value out of life uh, rather than uh, what they did before their experience. Yeah. So it's very, yeah, and those aspects are very similar because if you accept death and impermanence, then you have less fear for it as one aspect. And another aspect is motivates ourselves and into to thinking how to make life more valuable and more more richer, so to say. Yeah. I've met a lot, quite a lot of people who did meditation and I've got a, also an enhanced consciousness experience. So they went out of the body and were in the other higher dimension and it changed their life as well. Just, I know people, the first time they did meditation, then they went out. But totally, totally flabbergasted, overwhelmed by this experience. How many times does it happen when you do a meditation as a Buddhist? I mean, for us, it's very similar. People, yeah. when they come to meditation classes, they, they one aspect is just a mere relaxation, right, that yeah. it brings. It's not the main goal of meditation, yeah. but it's a kind of a result of it, right? And then people get a little bit of an idea, if you do concentration meditation, what consciousness is all about. Yeah. And if these experiences become more advanced, then it can be life-changing. We have courses running sometimes just for 10 days or something like that in a retreat kind of setting. And then for some people, just 10 days is life-changing in a very, very positive way. So that means if you train the mind in a particular way, then it's because consciousness is, is basically in charge if you train it well, right? So then there's a possibility of actually experiencing a more happier life after, you know, putting some effort in the training, so to say, yeah. yeah. And that starts with a motivation of, of, okay, this life is going to end, so what's the purpose of this all? And then, because of contemplating that in the permanence, then the spiritual part or whatever you call it, way of life, actually starts after that, right? Yeah. So, so yeah, very interesting to, to, to see the common grounds. Yeah. Yes, it is. Mm. There, there's also another path um, people have been talking about more and more lately towards you know, greater sense of meaning, purpose, less attachment, which is psychedelics. And I, yeah, I wonder if, um, you know, Dr. Van Lommel, you could, you could talk first about this. I actually don't have that much experience myself. In fact, no experience myself with this. Just, I, I'm just more of a meditator, but um, do you have any expertise or, you know, know the current, current research and experiences uh, on whether psychedelics give the same experience? I don't have personal experiences yeah. with, with psychedelics, but I know the literature. And it's quite interesting. So even to trip to me, which is part of ayahuasca and LSD and also psilocybin, uh, can have sometimes giving an experience a little bit like the death experiences. But most of the experiences are like hallucination, can be frightening, etc. When you measure brain activity during psychedelics like DMT or LSD or psilocybin, you see parts of the brain, brain becoming less active. And you have more consciousness. So it's a paradoxical occurrence. The same that we have in the depths of being a kind of class, there's no brain function at all, you have an enhanced consciousness. But you see in psychedelics also parts of the brain becoming less active if those people have really an experience of enhanced consciousness. And when you have really enhanced consciousness, that for me, Similarity is when they have transformation as well. But the majority of those people don't have transformation and have sometimes some aspects like an ND, but it's not equal to ND. But even although people have, can have the, uh, very deep experiences and they'll, they will change permanent. And they use it now also like Cetosabine in, in, in uh, terminal patients as well. And it's, it's helpful for them as well. Also the fear of death disappears. So it's helpful, to, to, it's not dangerous at all, but you need help to get the doses, to get the circumstances, etc. So it can be dangerous as well. And so I don't have any uh, experience either with the uh, psychedelics, but uh, I went to a few house parties in my early days hey. uh, when I was a student. And uh, yeah, there was only a little bit of smoking, but uh, it didn't go further than that, luckily. But uh, yeah, I mean, what 
I, I haven't really uh, dived into the studies of, of, of psychedelics in, in research as such. And in Buddhism, we don't really talk about it much because uh, it's it's not really an, a solution on the long term. It's just a very temporary one. And that's with all forms of, 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 of these kind of uh, uh, or substance abuse whatsoever. What's happening is actually that people at a particular time cannot deal with the problems in life, right? And then use kind of substances. And that's, that's very sad to see because we can solve problems, right? We can solve problems that are mental. We have the capacity to do that. But for temporary solutions can be bring some benefit that, and we see that people with depending on, on the kind of controlled form of, of, of psychedelic uh, therapy. That's what, what often what they talk about is they lose the sense of a self and they have this kind of oneness feeling with, with others, which is a very, in Buddhism context, is a constructive emotion. Compassion for others is be considered as a constructive emotion. And it, what, probably what happens is Brill, it helps him to come out of the cycle of a depression or come out of the cycle of a difficulty in life and see something else that is positive, right? But it's very temporary. It's not stable. It's just by the power of the psychedelic is being uh, enhanced or generated to a certain amount. But then actually what should happen is a follow up by mental training, right? And follow up by how to think, by how to uh, use that experience. And then not only use that experience, see the positive sides of the mind and try to develop them, try to develop these constructive emotions and try to transform the destructive ones into the constructive ones. And then you have a real kind of a complete kind of therapy. So that's, uh, then that way, probably it is a temporary solution. It helps, but it needs to be followed up by a training of, 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 of making it the more stable aspect of life, right? That, that this, these constructive aspects of emotion, like compassion, being oneness with others, et cetera, et cetera. So yeah, it needs to probably a follow up after that with some mental training. And then I think, uh, I don't suggest all the people who come to the Buddhist center to first use some psychedelics and then we talk later. But for some people in, in, in extreme cases, uh, then it can be a temporary solution. Yeah. Interesting for me to add is that psychedelics don't give the experience, but they disrupt the connection between the brain, body and consciousness. That's, that's how it works. DMT is also in the body as well. So it gives a disruption of the connection. Another thing is that, uh, what would I like? No, I'll come to that back perhaps. But, uh, yeah, so yeah, that means it's a kind of a temporary solution that people just get out of it because of the condition that has been created by this uh, psychedelic. But then still, work has to be done after that. Disruption is when they have a real experience of enhanced consciousness with transformation. Then the effect is permanent. But it is rather rare, it's an exception. Well, the other thing I want to tell is that we have a severe depression. People sometimes go to suicide. There have been literature about people who have a suicide, but they didn't succeed, it came back with an NDE. And they will never do it for the second time because they have experienced that the problems you try to get rid of, you take them with you. You cannot solve them in the other dimension. You have to solve them here in this life. So we had an NDE, you were suicide, you will never try it a second time because you have this insight that you have to solve it here and now. And, and there is suffering in life. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that's yeah. Yeah, it's, that's an interesting kind of kind of conclusion there because it's true. And in Buddhist kind of form of psychology, we also talk about the continuity of consciousness. So you there's, you know, you can escape, you can go on holidays, you can go everywhere you like, but consciousness always follows, right? So <laughs> all your positive things and your negative things follows with you. So the only thing, I had one, a few from my friends, they 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 went for uh, world trips, you know, you finish your studies, you get some money, and before you start a real career, you go for, for a world trip. That's what many people used to do in the early days. So they go from one place to the other place, and then they get bored one place, go to another place, get bored, go to another place. So it's a temporary solution. It looks like happiness, right? But then actually, after some time, they found out the consciousness is still with us. And if you don't deal with that aspect, then there's no escape where you go. So yeah, it's very interesting that it actually comes to the conclusion or the point that 
you know, if we really want to have transformation, we 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 have to do something. We have to put some effort in in in, in the mind, and it's possible to change. We have seen in in the research of these Olympic meditators that uh, it seems to work. So <laughs> so uh, yeah, there are, there are different methods, and it's not only Buddhism, right? There's many other forms of religion and faith that produce very similar results and and very similar methodologies. Uh, but in in modern Western culture, I think there's still a great need to 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 see these kind of rich cultures of spirituality, so to say. And we can present that in a very universal or, or secular way. It doesn't have to be called Buddhism or Hinduism whatsoever, but just use the techniques. And that can bring uh, can bring great benefit, I think. Yeah. But I'm positive for the future. I think the younger generation is much more open for change, much more open for changing the consciousness. So the younger generation is, we have, I think, I'm positive. But it creates a lot of work as well. And, and they use life as a learning experience as well. Mm. Maybe that's a nice optimistic place to end. <laughs> that, that the world is opening up to um, you know, the balance between um, mind and brain and, uh, and so on. Is there anything else either of you, you know, wanted to ask each other before we close out? Well, what I want to say is that it's striking how the ideas from Buddhism are the same as we, I have learned from people that have that experience. So the people in the death experience are always been my teachers. I, I always tell you, I've talked to thousands of them. And so it's a universal wisdom, which also comes from Buddhism as well. So thank you for the discussion. Yeah, and also thank you very much because when I was studying in the second chapter of Pramana Vartika, which is one particular subject that uh, discusses uh, reincarnation or the continuity of consciousness, so to say. When I was studying that, it's mainly logic-based kind of reasoning, which is very profound and very interesting. But uh, then also I started reading a lot about uh, your kind of research and 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 Ian Stevenson's research. And, and that actually for us as, as a Buddhist practitioner actually is kind of, oh, wow, this makes sense. So you have kind of you know, basically evidence of, of the continuity of consciousness, so to say. So if we can, the combination of the two, of logic in one way and, and scriptural reference or or scientific kind of evidence is, is kind of very solid. Uh, for So I also would like to thank you very much for all the work you have done and still doing, and also hope that you keep doing that uh, for, for a long time. And then, uh, yeah, I hope to meet you again when I'm in the Netherlands and uh, yeah, it would be nice to catch up because the place where you're living, I lived for about you know same village for about seven years. So yeah, maybe we can meet one day. Thank well, you so much. Let me know. Thank you. Thank you very much for your discussion. Thank you. Scott as well. Great. So Dr. Van Lomo Geshe Namdak, thank you so much for this wonderful conversation. I really enjoyed it, and I think people are going to benefit a lot from it.